us. But um, we're so excited to have him here. First service went phenomenally. He's an amazing speaker. So for those of you that haven't heard him, um, we're just so blessed to have him. So without further ado, Matt Mizell. Well, welcome to Anchor Church. Uh, I am a pastor at a church in California, just north of San Diego, in Carlsbad, California. And uh, I love New Mexico, growing up in New Mexico. And, and uh, just recently, Jared asked, he said, would you be willing to come over here and, and hang out at Anchor Church? And I was like, sure, I, I guess I will. I, I remember the first time that I ever met Jared. You know, uh, I was a, a freshman in high school, at Quavo High School. And he comes up to me. I'd known a little bit about Jared in mid-school, but I didn't know him that well. And he comes up to me in PE class at La Cueva, looks me dead in the eye, and he says, people think I'm strange. <laughs> Does that make me a stranger? <laughs> My best friend was born in a manger. And I was like, dude, that is the weirdest introduction. Like, who says hi? Like, normal people, hi, my name is Jared. And Jared, people think I'm strange. I'm like, yeah, you're a freak, dude. You're so strange. You're so weird. Anyway, that was my introduction to Jared, and we've remained friends for a long time. And so a few months ago, he called me, and he said, hey, would you be willing to come and speak at Anchor Church? And I was like, sure, bro. I'd love to come and hang out. I was like, what do you want me to teach on? He's like, whatever you want. And I was like, nah, there's got to be something. You want me to teach on something? He's like, no, for real, you can teach on whatever you want. And I was like, okay, fair enough. So I decided that we would talk about Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> totally We're not going to do that. I do think it is interesting, though, that one of those two candidates is going to be the president of the United States within just a few months' time. And, and one of the things that I'm super passionate about is, is leadership. And not just becoming a leader, but being a leader who is worth following. In fact, if there's one thing that I could teach on, it would be that. It would be... How do you become a leader who is actually worth following? And, and, and that's what I want to spend my, my time on this morning. You see, the very basic definition of a leader is, is up on the screen. A leader is a person who causes, and now it is, a person who causes somebody else to take action. If your words or your actions cause somebody else to take action, that means by default, this is a very basic definition, but by default you are a leader. If you're doing things and saying things and nobody's following, nobody's doing anything because of that, then if you have no followers, you, you aren't a leader. But if you cause somebody else to take any sort of action, then by definition, you are a leader. And here's the problem with some leaders. Some leaders become leaders by accident. They'll do something. They'll say something that will cause somebody else to do something or say something. It will elicit a response in somebody else. And by, by accident, they've caused somebody else to do something, and they become a leader not because they intended to, but because it just happened. The wind happened to blow that direction. The chips happened to fall that direction. And, and when you are that kind of leader, you could be a good leader, you might be a bad leader, but when there's no intentionality with it, you don't know what kind of leader you're actually going to be. And my hope is that you can choose to intentionally become a leader, not become a leader by accident. It reminds me of a story uh, several years ago when I graduated high school from La Cueva. Uh, Jared and I were, were, were good friends at that point, and I said, you know what, we should go on a trip together. We, we've just graduated, let's go out and explore the world. We're adults now, let's go on a road trip. And so, so my uncle and aunt in Florida, they own a, they owned a condo on a high-rise condominium unit right on Pensacola Beach. And as a gift to, to me as a graduating senior there, they said, we're going to allow you to have a, a week for free, no cost. You and your friends can come and hang out right on the beach. And I was like, yes, that's awesome. That's free. I totally like awesome and free. Let's go do that. <laughs> so so I, I invited a bunch of my friends. We decided we're going to road trip down there. Jared's mom was like, no, no, no. Jared doesn't take road trips. And I was like, oh, come on. Let him come. It's, it's, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be fun. She's like, I'll let him go. If you page me along the way to let me know that he's safe. When you get to Texas, you page me 13024. And that means he's safe. And I was like, for real? Okay. <laughs> okay. We got to Texas, 13324. We're page her. We get to Louisiana, 10325. <laughs> we get to Florida, 10326. We're paging her along the way. We get to Florida, totally fine, no problems. We get there. We go into this, this condominium unit, go into the, the elevator. We go up to the 12th floor where this condo is. We unload all of our luggage. We're looking at the beautiful view, all these glass windows. And we go up to the glass, and we're looking down 12 floors. And way down, there's a pool at the bottom. Past the pool, there's sand in the beach. And past that, the Gulf of Mexico. Just beautiful view. And my uncle's standing there, and I was like, uncle, we've got, we've got one week. What do we need to do? Where, what restaurants do we need to go to? What places? 
we, we would want to live it up while we're here, so tell us what we need to do. Tell me what I need to do at Pensacola Beach. And he's like, ever been crab hunting? <laughs> and I was like, come again? And he's like, have you ever been crab hunting? No. Is that like snipe hunting? <laughs> what exactly is crab hunting? And he's like, no, it's, it's a for real thing. You get a flashlight, you get a shovel, you get a bucket. You wait for the sun to go down, you go out into the beach, and there's crabs running around, and you scoop them up with your shovel, and you put them in a bucket. It's like, that's it? You eat them? He's like, nope, you just catch them. I'm like, okay, sounds awesome, sounds free. I like those two things. And so we wait for the sun to go down. All my friends and I, we go down to the pool, we're hanging out in the hot tub, the sun goes down. Jared, Jared's like, you know what, I've been driving all day. I think I'm going to go to bed. I think I'm going to call, call it an early night. We're like, dude, first night in Florida, you can't have like, an early night, you can't pansy out on the rest of us. He's like, sorry, I'll hang out with you guys tomorrow. So he goes to bed, another guy goes to bed. Two of our, our crew go to bed, we're like, forget that. We're, we're gonna stick it, we're gonna stick it out, and we're gonna, we're gonna go, and we're gonna crab hunt. So we go up back to the condo. We dig through the, the, the closets, we find shovels, we find buckets, we find flashlights, we go back down the elevator, go out to the sand. It's dark by this point, it's like 10, 11 o'clock at night, just the moonlight and our flashlights, and we find, we find use the flashlights in the sand, and all of a sudden, this little crab runs by. And all of us start taking off after the crab. And he's like one of those little, you know, side winder. This is my imitation of a crab. He's like going sideways and he's running towards the water, out of the sand, towards the water. And all of us guys, five of us, are sprinting after. You're all 18-year-old, 19-year-old guys sprinting after this crab on the beach. And he gets all the way down to the water and gets swept away in the, in the wave. Didn't catch him. So we're like, well, that's a fast crab. That's a, that's a fast little guy. We, we shine the flashlight over here and we see another crab. We all start running after that crab. He runs down to the water, gets into the water, gets away. And we're like, these crabs are brilliant crabs. They're very fast crabs, very smart. We're smarter. We decided we're going to go up by, by the water. We're going to go down where the water is because those crab, crabs keep running to the water instead of away from the water. We're going to go down there. And when, when we scare the crabs, they're going to run down towards the water. And we're going to be there ready to scoop them up. So sure enough, we shine the flashlights. We're down, down by the water. We shine the flashlights back under the sand. The crabs get scared, they run straight towards us, and I'm there with my scooper, and I put them in the bucket. I'm like, yeah, caught me a crab, I'm a crab hunter. <laughs> or crocodile hunter or something. We catch a second crab, a third crab. We have all these buckets, like four or five buckets, and we're catching dozens and dozens of crabs. And they're crawling all around, they got their beady eyes looking at us, and they're just overflowing these buckets, and we fill up all these buckets, and we're like, now what? <laughs> what do we do with all these crabs? It's, it's, so we're like, we can't eat them, none of us know how to cook crabs. But we didn't want to let him go because Jared's sleeping like a princess upstairs. And so we want to show him what our crab catch was like. And so we decided, let's, let's keep the crab. Let's, let's take him up to the condo. So we, we take all these crabs in our buckets up the elevator. We go into the kitchen. We're like, where do we put all these crabs? There's like 30, 40 something crabs or so. Let's put them in the kitchen sink. <laughs> Why not? We put them in the kitchen sink. Turned on the little uh, garbage just Just kidding. I didn't uh, put, them in, put them in the kitchen sink. And we're like, now what? Let's go find more crabs. We go down the elevator, we get more buckets of crabs, bring them back up the elevator. By the time we come back, the crabs are crawling on top of each other, trying to get out of the sink. And none of them have gotten out, but we're like, we can't risk putting another 30 or 40 crabs in there with the other ones, because they're all gonna scatter around and be everywhere. So we took them all out, and we're like, let's, let's just put them in the bathtub, I guess. <laughs> so we go to the bathroom, put all these crabs. Now there's like 60, 70 something crabs or so, they're just crawling all around with their eyes. And it was really a creepy looking scene. So all, the, all these crabs are in there. It's about 2 a.m. at this point. We all, we all say, well, we'll wake up and figure out what to do with the crabs in the morning. We all go to bed. 6 a.m. I'm sleeping. And I hear a blood curdling scream that wakes me up from the bathroom. Jared had woken up, didn't know we had gone crab hunting. And goes into the bathroom and, and he pees. And, and he sees these crabs crawling around and ah! like a little girl. Ah! He runs over to where I'm sleeping. He's pushing me. He's like, Matt, Matt. I'm like, what? He's like, they crawled up the train. They crawled up the train. <laughs> At which point I'm like half delirious and he's like half naked. And I'm like, they didn't crawl. And then I was like, oh yeah, they did. They, let's, let's just play along. I was like, are they the killer crabs that I saw in 2020? He's like, what? Killer crabs? <laughs> Anyway, I couldn't keep my poker face for very long, and so I tell him, I was like, dude, we went crab hunting last night, and you slept through it, so we'll go again at another time. But then all of us were like, what do we do with all these crabs? We have all these crabs crawling around. Like, what do we do now? And so we're like, well, I guess, I guess we'll have breakfast, and then go, go release them back into the ocean. So we have breakfast, we put them all back in the buckets, and we go out there. And about this time, it's about noon in the afternoon. 
we had gotten the crabs. We had hunted for them around like 11 o'clock, midnight or so. There's nobody on the beach, but now it's noon. Middle of the summer, hundreds of people around. There's people laid out on blankets and towels and under umbrellas and there's people playing volleyball, playing with their little kids and having, <laughs> having picnics. And, and here we are, like it's so packed out. I mean, people everywhere, hundreds of them, we're, we're carrying buckets of crabs, like through people, trying to like not drop, drop crabs on these people. And we get, we get to the very the waterfront, we're like, you know what, we can totally mess with people and dump the crabs out in the sand and let them run towards the water and people freak out and everything. But we, you know, we're nice guys, we decided we don't want to do that. So instead, we're going to dump the crabs out right by the water. The wave would sweep them up. They'd take them away. That's the plan, at least. What we didn't know is that crabs during the night run towards the water. <laughs> crabs during the day run away from the water. So we dumped 60, 70 something crabs right by the water, thinking they're going to go the other direction. And they start booking it towards all the people that are laid out. And one woman is back here, and she, ah! and all these other hundreds of people look at the screaming woman, and they see this herd of crabs coming towards them. It was like a Stephen King movie or something, like crabs galore, galore coming. And all these people are picking up their kids, and they're running, and they're picking up their towels. It's like the splitting of the Red Sea. All these people are just growing one direction or the other. And we're, all of us guys are like, that was totally awesome. <laughs> now, now the question is, if I had known that was going to happen, I didn't know that was going to happen, but if I had known that was going to happen, would I have done that? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> For sure. But I didn't know. We, we caused all these hundreds of other people to take action, instant action, not because we intended to, but because it was an accident. Unintentional. And this is how so many people go through life. They go through life of, oh, maybe I'll lead people. Maybe I'll inspire people. Maybe I'll use my life to impact other people. But I'm not going to be intentional about it. I'll just let it happen. If I happen to impact somebody, if I happen to build somebody, if I happen to encourage somebody, as it happens, then I'll let it happen. But I'm not going to look for opportunities to make that happen. And I want to encourage you to, instead of just letting yourself accidentally become a leader, I want to encourage you to choose to be a leader. Choose to be a leader, not just any leader, though. Be a leader who is actually worth following, a godly type of leader. A leader, a leader that has the ability to use your life to impact other people and to change people's eternities. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're like, well, I, I, I'm just not a leader. God hasn't designed me that way. It's not a gift set that I have. It's not how I've been created. Vince Lombardi, coach of an NFL team, Green Bay Packers, one of the best known coaches of all time, one of the best known leaders of, of NFL players of all time, said this about leadership. He said, leaders are, are made. They are not born. They are made by hard effort, which is the price which, with, which all of us must pay to achieve any goal that is worthwhile. And I believe this. So leaders are made. They're not necessarily born. You can choose to become a leader if you feel that becoming a leader is a goal that's worthwhile. And my hope is that you choose to say, yes, I believe that becoming a leader who is worth following is a worthwhile goal. Now, if that's you, if you're sitting here this morning thinking, I want to be a worthwhile leader. I want to make an impact. I want to leave this world different and better than how I found it. I want my life to matter. If that's you, then, then let's explore scripture together this morning. There's two stories from the Bible that talk about leadership. The first one we find is in, in the book of 1 Kings chapter 12. And if you brought your Bible, or I think we give away free Bibles at Anchor Church, but if you received a, a free Bible at one point from Anchor, it's on page 293. If you brought your own Bible, you can, uh, you can turn to the middle of the Bible, actually, in, in the book of Psalms, go backwards a little bit. If you find First and Second Chronicles, keep going backwards. If you hit First and Second Samuel, if you went too far, it's right in between, First and Second Kings uh, in the Old Testament. <laughs> Anyway, so we'll also have the verses up on the screens, but let me give you the back backstory as you find the, the right book. Here's the backstory. There's a guy named King Solomon, and many of you have heard that name before. And the reason you've probably heard that name before, even if you've never come to church before, the reason you've probably heard of the name Solomon is because Solomon is widely regarded in secular world, in the secular world as well as religious circles as one of the wisest men to ever walk the earth. And the reason why he was one of the wisest men to ever walk planet Earth is because at one point God gave him an option. Do you want riches or do you want a long life? Just curious, really quickly, raise your hand. If you would rather have riches as opposed to a long life, raise your hand. Who would rather have a long life as opposed to riches? A couple of you, okay. God comes to Solomon and says, would you rather have riches, a long life? He gives him a third option, or wisdom. 
You want to be rich? Do you want to have a long life or wisdom? And he thinks about it, and he responds back to God. He says, I want wisdom. And therefore, God, because he chose smartly, gives him all three. So he starts writing down all this information, all this wisdom. Because King Solomon wants his life to impact other people. He wants to leave a legacy. And so he starts writing down all this wisdom that he's learned from God, but also wisdom that he's learned from other rulers, other kings around. You see, he was a, 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 King Solomon is a ruler over the land of Israel. And under his rulership, under his kingship, he was responsible for 12 different tribes. And all these 12, the, the, all these 12 tribes fall underneath King Solomon's leadership. And so he wants to lead them well, but he knows that someday he's going to pass away. So he wants to pass on a legacy of leadership, a quality leadership to his son who will eventually take over the throne. So he writes down in this book all these little bits of information of how you should be a leader, what you should do, what you should not do, what you should avoid. And he packages it in this little book that we now know as the book, we know as the book of Proverbs. And that book of Proverbs was intended to give to his son. His son is Rehoboam. One day King Solomon passes away and his son Rehoboam becomes the king, becomes the new ruler. He inherits 12 tribes of Israel. And now he's responsible for leading these 12 tribes. Dad gave him a blueprint, yet Dad gave him the book of Proverbs to, to lead them. But very, very soon after he takes over the throne, some of the people of the tribes come to King Rehoboam. And they basically say, King, I know you're a new king. I know you're a new ruler. Life's hard. Life is very difficult. And that's where we pick up the story. 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in verse 4 is where we're going to jump in. By the way, uh, I asked for a stool and somebody brought me this thing. I don't know. I don't know why Jared has a Broncos. Whatever. Um, 1 Kings chapter 12, starting in verse 4. This is when the people of Israel come over to uh, King Rehoboam and, and they make a request to him. And this is what they, what they say, starting in verse 4. They say, your father has put a heavy yoke on us. But now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke you put on us, and we, we will serve you forever. We will serve you. In other words, what they're saying is that, you know, life has gotten very difficult in Israel. Uh, if you could help us out, King, I mean, you have the ability, you have the authority. If you could help us out a little bit, maybe lower our taxes a little bit, we will honor you, we will serve you, we will follow you. Now, the king, he's a new king. He doesn't know what to do. People are asking, can you help us out? And he's like, what do I do? I'm a brand new leader. So, so this is what he says, verse 5, Rehoboam answered. He says, go away for three days and then come back to me. In other words, let me sleep on it. Let me think about what to do. So the people leave. They go away. And as they go away, King Rehoboam tries to get advice. What should I do? Should I lower the taxes? Should I make life easier for these people? So first thing he does, he goes and, and finds the elders, the people that used to advise his dad. The people that used to give advice and insight to King Solomon when he was over these 12 tribes, he goes to those people. In verse 6, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. King Rehoboam asks, how would you advise me to answer these people? These elders, in verse 7, they reply, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Now, this is an interesting type of leadership, isn't it? Because he's the king, he's the ruler, and here these advisors are saying, if you serve these people, if you become their servant, they will follow you. King Rehoboam thinks about it, he considers it. He's like, I want a second opinion. Isn't that funny how sometimes people come up to you and they're like, hey, there's this thing going on in my life, will you give me advice? And you give them advice, and they're like, mm, thanks. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go ask somebody else what they think. <laughs> King Rehoboam doesn't like what the elders of his dad said, so he goes and asks his buddies, who don't have a whole lot of leadership experience. Continues on with the story in verse 9. He asks his buddies, these younger guys, he says, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your fathers put on us? Verse 10, the young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have sent you, your, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now you go tell them. His friends are saying to Rehoboam, you go tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. If I will make it even harder. My father scourged you with whips, and I will scourge you with scorpions. In other words, what his friends, what his buddies are saying, they say, you put your foot down. You let them know who's boss. You don't take any sort of nonsense from these people. You let them know the buck stops with you. You are the king. You are the ruler. 
They serve you. Now compare these two types of leadership models. You have the elders who are saying, hey, you should be a servant to your people. Here are these younger guys who don't have a whole lot of experience are saying, hey, you need to let them know. Put them in their place because you are the king. It's King Rehoboam. He has to think about it. What do, what do I do? Do I be a servant to these people or do I tell them I'm the boss and I'm going to make life more difficult for them because I can? He thinks about it, considers it. Here's what happens, verse 12. Three days later, Jer Jeroboam and all the people returned to King Rehoboam as the king had said. Come back to me in three days. Verse 13, the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given to him by the elders, and he followed the advice of the young men. Now, as a pastor, I also have some other passions that God has instilled within me. I love business, I love marketing, I love advertising, I love statistics. Let's just look at the effectiveness of this particular leadership model. King Rehoboam, he's a leader. He can choose well, however to lead these people. He has one option, lead them as servants or lead them by putting the foot down. And, and he has 12 different tribes. Of the 12 tribes that he inherited, how effective was that particular leadership model? If you continue reading the story, you will find out that very quickly, of those 12 tribes, 11 of them said, you know what? No thanks. We don't want to follow you, king. We, we don't like how you're leading. You're not a leader who is worth following. So we are literally picking up our tents. We are picking up our homes. And we're going to go find another country to live in. Because we don't want to be under your king, kingship. Eleven out of the twelve tribes failed. If you do the math, it's 92%. This whole platform of people that he had to lead, 92% of them said, no thank you. I'm not following you. That's the first story. Let me tell you the second story that we find in the Bible. The second story we find in book of John chapter 13 and and as you it's Matthew Mark Luke John the New Testament as you flip there again we'll put some verses on the screen for you but let me give you the backstory before we get into that that particular story the backstory is that there's 12 guys again there's that number 12 12 guys that walk from town to town village to village and they're following after a leader leader leader's name is Jesus of Nazareth and these guys are following, and, and oftentimes when they're going from town to town, village to village, home to home, these guys are fighting. And on multiple occasions, they're fighting, and the conversations typically go like this. Hey, who do you think's the best disciple? Who do you think's number one of all these disciples? And these guys are fighting, and they're battling. I'm number one. No, I'm number one. No, Jesus loves me more. No, I'm cooler than you. No, I'm better than you. And they're, they're always fighting, and they're arguing. And one time, they walk in, into the city of Jerusalem, and they go up into this this upper room where they're going to have dinner in this banquet hall. And typically when they walk into a room and they're about to have dinner together, there's usually a table that's set up, but before they have dinner, usually there's a servant by the front door. And the servant by the front door is in charge of washing people's feet when they enter into this room. And the reason why they enter or enter the room and wash a feet before anything else, before they eat the meal, is because back then they didn't have stools, they didn't have chairs. They would sit on the floor usually, and they would have a table set up, usually a lower table. And rather than sitting on, the, on, on a chair, they would recline by the table. And when, as you were reclining, you were eating, but because you were reclining, somebody else's feet were right next to you. So you would be reclining next to somebody else's feet, thus... They wash feet before they eat a meal. It's customary. We wash hands before we eat a meal. They walk into this room. There's no servant there. Nobody's there to wash feet. They all sit down, reclining by the table. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Everybody's got dirty feet. We shouldn't have dirty feet. We're about to eat a meal. But all these guys, I'm presuming, are thinking, I'm not going to be the one to wash feet. I'm too good. I'm better than all these other disciples. I'm number one. I'm Jesus' favorite. Nobody else, nobody else here is as cool as me, so therefore somebody else needs to serve me. Somebody else needs to wash my feet. Now, all these guys are too arrogant, too prideful to say, I'm going to wash other people's feet until Jesus steps up. He sees the need that hasn't been done, and that's where we pick up the story in John chapter 13, starting in verse 4. Here's what happens. Verse 4, Jesus got up from the meal, took off his own clothes, his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Verse 5, after that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Verse 9, Peter replied then, Lord, not just my feet, my hands, but my head as well. Compare this model of leadership that Jesus is demonstrating. Compare to King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam says, 
You will follow me. I will force you to agree with me. You will do as I say. Compare that leadership model to Jesus's, where he says, I I'm going to show you the right thing to do. I'm going to serve you. And by serving you, I am, I am by example telling you what you should be doing in your life. The story continues on. Here's what happens. In Mark chapter 10, 45, Jesus says this. He says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to, to serve. So that I'm not here to not here to, to be served. I'm here to give. I'm here to give my life as a ransom. How oh, again, compare this leadership model. King Rehoboam had 12 different tribes that he was responsible over. 11 of them failed. 92% of his leadership platform took off. Jesus had 12 followers. In those 12 followers, how many of them chose to continue on and stick with Jesus? We know that Peter denied him three times, but he changed his mind and came back and chose to follow Jesus to his death. Judas decided he wasn't going to follow after Jesus, and he, so he, he was no longer a follower of Jesus. Of the 12 followers of Jesus, 11 of them stuck, it, stuck out with Jesus. 11 of them stuck, stuck around. 12 of the tribes left King Rehoboam said 92% of them didn't want his leadership. 11 of, of or 11 of the 12, uh, 11 of 12 Jesus' disciples chose to stick around. 92% of them chose to stay. Now again, if you just compare those two leadership models, 8% stuck, 92% stuck. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you just look at these two models of leadership, it's very apparent that Jesus' model is more impactful. His is more, his is, has a better uh, ability to stick, and people want to follow Jesus. Why? Because he's a leader who's worth following. That's not even considering the fact that after that last supper that Jesus had, where he washed their feet, the very next day he was crucified, he was murdered in cold blood. You know the story. Three days later, he rose again. And then he had a final sermon with his, his 11 remaining disciples. In that final sermon, we refer to it as the Sermon on the Mount. In that Sermon on the Mount, he gathers his 11 remaining disciples, and he says, I've, I've trained you, I've taught you, now it's your turn. I'm, I'm going to let you loose. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. We call this the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm with you always till the very end of the age. Now it's your turn. I've shown you. I've served you. Now you go and do it. Now is that effective? Was that effective? I presume it was because if those 11 guys had stayed silent and chose not to do anything, then none of us would be here this morning. We wouldn't be having church this morning. But did you know that because those 11 guys chose to step up and say, you know what, I am adopting this leadership model as my own. I want to impact my sphere of influence. I want to go to my family, my community. I want to go to my world, my city. I want to go and make disciples as Jesus instructed that I should do. There's now 3.78 billion people worldwide that now believe in Jesus. Why? Not by accident. That didn't happen unintentionally. It's because 11 guys saw that leadership demonstrated. And they said, I want to make that my own leadership. I'm going to go change my world. And now half of the world believes in Jesus. Why? Because 11 teenage boys stood up and said, I will Im implement this servant leadership model. We have a choice. We can go through life just waiting for maybe opportunities. Maybe I get to be a leader. Maybe I get to change somebody's life. Maybe I get to impact people. Or... You can say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to choose to do the hard work. I will. I will make a difference. I want my life to, to matter. I want to impact other people. When I'm dead and gone someday, I want my life to continue on. You see, here's the reality that I, I learned just a few years ago. I guess something that I realized. You know, I, I honestly, whenever my day comes and I pass away, I don't care what the number is in my day. I don't care how many assets that I have, because more than likely people are just going to distribute them and divide them and fight over them. I don't really care about that number. What I care about is that my life continues to live on after I'm done. And how is my life going to live on? It's probably not through my bank account. It's probably not through a home or assets or cars or anything like that. What's going to live on is, is how I've impacted other people. And if I have led them in, in the right direction, here's what happens. 
when you lead somebody in the right direction, then they take that, and now they can lead people in the right direction. And they can lead people in the right direction. And here's what's beautiful to me, and here's what I hope my life, here's how I hope my life ends one day. I, I view it as like a family tree that I've impacted all these people on this first level, and then those people say, you know what, I, I want to be a Jesus-like leader. And then they impact people, and they impact people, and they impact people. And I don't know, I don't know what heaven's gonna look like one day. I don't know what that looks like if you stand at the pearly gates or something and, and, and there's all these people behind you that you've impacted. But how cool would that be if, if you're standing at the gates and, and you're about to go into heaven and then you have one opportunity to look behind you and see all the people that you've impacted. See all the people that are there because you had some sort of role in their life. I don't know if that's going to be how it is, but how sweet of a moment that would be. To say, you know, what was most important in my life wasn't trying to acquire wealth and to acquire all this stuff, but I used my time, my most valuable asset, my most valuable resource to invest and pour into other people to make a difference. See, I hope that's what you're about as well. I hope that you say, I want my life to matter. I want to have purpose. And if you want to have purpose, then I would encourage you, be a leader because you can use your breath. You can use your life to impact other people. But don't just be an accidental, unintentional leader. Be intentional. Choose to be a leader, and of all the leadership models you can look at, choose to adopt Jesus' model. Be a servant. And what does this mean to you? Maybe, maybe you're a husband. You were called to lead your wife. How do you lead your wife? Well, I'm the man of the house. You bring me a remote. You go bring me a beer. You bring me blah, blah, blah. Or, how can I serve you, honey? How can I put your needs above my own? Maybe you're a mom. You got little kids running around, you're pulling your hair out. Oh, I can't stand this chapter of my life. <laughs> you have a, a role to parent and lead and guide, but what if you start serving your kids? How can you put their needs above your own? Maybe you're a business owner. You've got employees underneath you, and you can put your foot down and say, this is how it is. The buck stops with me. Or maybe as your employees are, are pouring in and investing into your company, maybe you say, you know what? I'm going to give you a couple days of extra vacation. Not because you've earned it or because I have to, because I want to invest in you. I want to serve you and your family. I want to give to you because your needs and your family are a greater priority than mine. What can you do? You see, sometimes I think we make it so complicated. We have to be this certain type of leader. We have to look for all these different ways that we can be leaders. And Jesus makes it so simple. He says, if you just give somebody a cup of cold water in my name, you've done it for me. You just, you just bless somebody. Serve people. You want, to, you want to be a leader, be a servant. You want to be first, be last. You want to be somebody that's an impactful, life-changing, legacy-building person. Be a leader who's worth following. And to be a leader who's worth following, adopt for yourself Jesus' model. Choose to be a servant type of leader. And your life will outlive you. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word. Thank you for scripture, God. I thank you for sending your son. He gives us, gives us the blueprint for what to do and what not to do. He gives us an idea of how to become a leader, a leader who is worth following. Father, I, I pray that you change our passions and our desires in life. That we could, we could realize that we can leave a legacy, that when we are gone one day, that this world will be better because you have placed us in. And you've given us each a platform of people that we have influence over. And the very basic definition of being a leader is to cause somebody else to take action. We have families represented here this morning. Businesses, ministries, relationships. God, I pray that you can make each one of us a, an intentional, not an accidental leader, but somebody that, that can realize that our life matters. You've put us in our sphere of influence on purpose. God, use our words, use our actions. Give us opportunities to lead, to be selfless, to be servants. May we lead by example. Father, we thank you for your example. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for all that you do for us, your grace, your patience, your understanding, your forgiveness. We thank you for all those things, and we thank you especially for your son, Jesus, who leads us and guides us. He's the ultimate leader who is worth following. May we follow him as other people follow us. We say this in his son, in, in Jesus' name. Amen.